Um, so thank you, and I must say I'm really enjoying myself. This whole day has been so far really uh, fun. Um, and what's really nice for me is the breadth of topics, the breadth of methods, and how it's all kind of seemingly weaved together. Um, and I must say, just as a continuing the immigrants, so my name is now often I'm here uh, for this year at the Weizmann Institute, uh, visiting on sabbatical, but I'm from uh, Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and then I have a third grade and a fifth grade that are trying, struggling, reading, to learn to read in Hebrew, and that dotting is a very essential aspect of it. Um, so it, it, it relates in many different ways. Um, but what I'm here to talk to you about today is some of the studies that I have been uh, conducting um, uh, it, back in, uh, in the US, in Detroit. Um, and what I'm really interested in is, is, in the develop, is the development of memory. Today I'm going to talk about hippocampal maturation uh, and how that relates to the development of episodic memory. And really the question that I am kind of keep trying to break into small interesting questions for me to develop uh, research uh, around is what is memory development the development of? It's a title of a very influential um, um, symposium that was um, handled like 1971, and then the answers were range of behavioral cognitive constructs that all kind of fit into what is memory and how does memory development develop. And nowadays that we have all these fantastic cognitive neuroscience tools and all these many different types of neuroimaging methods, we can go back and address that same uh, kind of big question by linking it to the brain. And I do it in many different ways, looking at function, uh, which I won't talk about today, uh, but also looking at brain structure. And the way I think about answering uh, what are the questions that are in interesting that could bring measures of brain structure is really trying to identify uh, the development of the brain as kind of providing the endogenous constraints that uh, shapes what the child can or cannot do compared to an adult. Um, so this is kind of the summary of the thinking uh, in general. And um, when we think about, so we have to think about the brain, we also have to carefully think about behavior. And as I said, I mentioned episodic memory. For those of you who are less um, um, knowledgeable about memory, then we can think about it in many different ways. Um, but it seems to be the case that there's some aspects of memory, when we look at the patterns of behavior across age, that seem to be more sensitive to age, some that are less sensitive. Um, so I'll give you one example of a, a one task that we tested in the lab that I'll show you some data with uh, a bit later. Um, in this uh, very simple memory task, uh, the participants studied pairs of words. Um, uh, there's a range of them. They study all the pairs, try to remember not just what they've seen, but the specific pairings, and there's some distraction task, after which we ask them uh, two different types of memory tests, whether they remember the specific words, we call this an item recognition, or do they remember the specific pairings. That is, all of those words are words in the, in the, in the associative memory test are words that they have seen before, but they would have been either presented with the sa in the same pairing or in different pairings. Now we can ask how do uh, participants of different ages perform this, and we did uh, find that when you look at age, and note here that most of the data I'll show you is from age eight and up. Um, I do conduct studies with slightly younger, studying maybe five-year-olds, um, but this is eight to 24, and you can see in red, this is the performance on the associative recognition, that is remembering, remembering the specific pairing, that the, a word, two words were presented together at study. And this is what shows age difference in terms of improvement across age, whereas for just remembering that they've seen the word cat versus another word that they haven't seen, that seems to be fairly stable. So this is one example of a, of a study, but my general synthesis of many other studies that have been conducted with the same idea of trying to identify what's, what improves with age and what seems to be stable with age, kind of give that similar, provides this uh, uh, distinction. It would be things like associative memory, or in general, remembering more details, or within memory, people talk about recollection, uh, and those are what the aspects that improve with age, where the other aspects, just remembering the item, just, remem just the sense of familiarity, those seem to be fairly stable across age. 
So we have some uh, handle on a behavior that you can start, in, start asking, okay, how does the brain seem to be related to improvement or maybe stability in those uh, specific aspects of memory? Um, and then we kind of bring back the brain uh, and where in the brain do we start? Obviously, because we like, I like uh, memory. I uh, studied the whole brain, but in this talk, I'm really focusing on the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, that you can see here is a very complex structure. You can look at it along its long axis, you can look at the cross section in it and see very specific organization within it and this organization within it, uh, what you can see highlighted or marked here in a specific histological uh, slice are the hippocampal subplots. The way the hippocampal function is by specific flow information between the different cytoarchitectonically un uh, identified uh, units, which are those uh, subfields. Cytoarchitectonically, you see they kind of stain differently. That is, they have different composition of, of uh, cells. So, kind of to make it more specific, the question that I'm uh, trying to going to try and answer now that I've set up the stage for this bit of my work is: Can I link age differences in hippocampal volume to age differences? in memory, the specific memory aspects that I've uh, shown you before. And uh, now take this, so this is a broad question and we can start breaking this up into these two uh, related and underlying complementary questions that I want to answer if I want to provide a good uh, answer to this bigger question. First, are there age differences in hippocampal subfield volumes? We want to see some age differences so we have something to link if I'm telling you that it might be limiting or enabling different type of cognitive uh, abilities, then we want to see also that there is some age difference in the way, in the measurements that I can get from those uh, structures. And then when I have this, I can try to map this onto the individual differences that I have in memory. So you're all agreeing with me, I'll just flash <laughs> in front of you. Uh, that there is, those are indeed question one and two and they're related and they'll give me the answer, but I really cannot start anything uh, in that kind of uh, attacking that research question without establishing that I have good and reliable measurements uh, of the brain, of the part of the brain, the, the, the unit, the level of unit that I, I want to uh, be able to link then ultimately to the behavior. So can we reliably measure Couple subgrid volumes, and uh, I showed you here this very nice uh, histologically stained slice. We don't have that in vivo uh, at a large uh, scale, you know, there are, or, or behaving uh, organisms, right? Uh, so we are going into what we do have, and this is um, a high resolution structural images of the brain. But it's still on us to try to figure out whether it's possible to get good um, uh, measurements of the volume of the hippocampus at that level of the hippocampus subfields. And luckily, when I was kind of really gearing and very excited to test this, I uh, um, kind of hooked up with a large group of people who were very interested in similar questions and were working for a few years at the time already on improving the the method so we can have those type of measures and it all starts with having a very good uh, high resolution image of the brain and not just any high resolution, it should, needs to be this specific uh, T2 proton density, turbo spin echo uh, type of uh, image that highlights the boundaries so we can use the white matter in order to be able to trace exactly where the um, uh, boundaries between subfields are. So what you see here uh, is um, a, it is an example of this slice, it's a 0.4 millimeter in-plane resolution. Those are thick slices, but they have good resolution in a way. The thickness probably helps us actually delineate better those, uh, those markers that we uh, are using. And we are using uh, these very elaborate manual uh, tracing protocols right now because, um, uh, and we're making sure that we can, we have a, as much valid as we can protocol that we can reliably uh, use. That is that we establish very high reliability between independent raters before they even go into and, and start tracing real data. 
so this is uh, work that was started by Anna Dorothy and, and continued with another graduate student in my lab, Sidney Liu. Now that we have this, we can start asking, and I'm happy to talk more, but not now, we can start asking, are there age differences in the brain? Uh, by tracing the data that I have collected and then collaborating with another colleague down the hall that collected a lot of data with exactly the same, this is where I got this uh, beautiful uh, um, uh, protocol and, and, and methods uh, in older adults across down the hall from me. Um, and we put this all together in one paper to show that indeed we can identify, this is from 8 to 82, and there's about a bit over than 200 uh, brains that were segmented, uh, manually of course, all of them. Uh, and you can see that there are age differences across the lifespan in some of the subfields but not in other subfields. And the same is uh, true if I'm just showing you the part of data that I, uh, that is the developmental data from 8 to 26. Um, and specifically note here that in one of the subfields, the CA3 or combined subfield of CA3 data gyrus, region that we know is very important specific for this type of very uh, specific memory. Remembering details and being able to both separate them and, and, and maybe combine or use, take uh, advantage of the use of details. Uh, there was some age difference, seemed to go uh, down linearly within this age range. Now, uh, so we answered, we have reliable measures, there are age differences, we can go back to try to link it to behavior, I already showed you the behavior, that's exactly the task that we use. And now remember we have some age differences in the associative, not in the item. Uh, and what we did is we took all the measures and the behavior, oh, sorry, and the, and the behavior and put it all together in a structural equation model, that modeling approach uh, that allowed us to show that there are the age differences, this is what I showed you in the previous slide, there are age differences in the volume specifically of CA3 dente gyrus, that the age related the reduction in the volume. And that was the only region that was directly related to that type of memory that I told you it should be related to, associative memory. Nothing was related to uh, individual differences in item memory. Uh, and that specific um, path that I showed you now uh, was a significant uh, indirect effect. That is to say, right here, Smaller C3 dented gyrus volume does partially account for age related improvement in associative memory. So it's really specific that we find those subfields related to this one aspect of memory that uh, differs by age. This is another way to see it, the same thing, so I'll skip it. And just to say we answered those questions, we can say you behave and, and, and move on, but of course there's a lot of work to continue in each of those questions. For the first one, uh, can we reliably measure? We're still working really hard. I told you I kind of plugged into this large group of people that are all excited about getting the best me me measurements. And one of the things to make them best is that we all use the same. It has to be harmonized. It has to be that we all decide of the, dif uh, of the boundary between subfields at the same place. So we all agree that if we see differences, they actually are the same part. And this has really uh, been going on for for, for a few years, for many years now, and we're making progress. It's slow, because there's a lot of people have to agree. It's slow also for m many interesting reasons. So uh, the anatomists we bring up to on board don't seem to fully agree. So it's not just the radiologists, expert radiologists have a little bit of leftover that kind of is not quite uh, exactly the same. The anatomists that work with the stained slices have slight different uh, ideas about where exactly to mark the boundaries, and then from that, we need to kind of figure out, okay, we ask them, so do you, is it okay without seeing anything on the MRI image? It will be about here. And they tell us yes, and we move on. Um, other things, uh, and then I'll be done, is that for the question one, age differences in subfields, we really don't know because, uh, so I showed you some, I, it might be convincing, but I myself, I'm not fully convinced un until I have larger data sets and longitudinal samples. And this is just kind of a nice um, uh, way to show how uh, good it is to have longitudinal data with, uh, with um, uh, structural images. This is the same individuals two years apart. And it's really nice to see that you can recognize the same hippocampus, that it came from the same individual. It's very similar. Now we can quantify and look more carefully at the age difference, at the change 
Okay, now I said very carefully age differences, this is change. And lastly, we need to have a wide enough range of, um, of both um, experimental tasks that we are coming up and statistical approaches to pull it all together so we can uh, have more um, um, specific linking between those uh, cognitive constructs and brain and differences in the brain, ultimately to answer the question of what is memory development, is the development of, and I've shown you just one uh, bit that we can achieve in this. Thank you very much, of course, and thank you for all the people in my lab that have done most of the work that I have presented. Thank you very much.